Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless it. You can stop praying now. You can stop praying. I said you could stop praying. And then Father Carmine reached over and took some holy water and blessed the person again. And then the demon manifested and goes, I told you to stop praying. Hi, thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, let me start by saying thank you so, so much for taking the time to watch this video, and hopefully you'll learn something from this. It's going to be a rather long video, but I've put together some important points shared by exorcists through their lectures and interviews you'll find interesting. I've placed the links to the full length each audio clip shared, so feel free to check it out later on. Now buckle up and let's get on with this then. During one lecture at St. Matthew the Catholic Parish on the subject of exorcism, Father Vincent Lampert explained that during an exorcism, the church is throwing the light of Jesus on the devil and his demons. And when that happens, they will always scurry away and flee. Anytime we were being attacked by the devil, we can also take what he's doing against us and use that to our advantage. But what does he mean by that? Whenever an enemy is attacking, where do they attack? At the perceived weakness in a person's defenses. So if you believe you're being attacked by the devil, then he's attacking what he perceives to be a weakness in your life. You now know what you need to shore up in your spiritual life as a way to defeat the devil. So again, anytime the devil is attacking us, we can take what he's doing to us and use it to our advantage to grow in holiness and virtue. And finally, the devil does not possess any particular strength. If we are willing to resist him, we will see that his power was never more than a facade and it will quickly crumble before us. Demons have power. They can only be defeated by power. The power that defeats them is the power of God and the ministry of exorcism is one of the ways that we call upon the power of God to defeat the devil and his demons. Did you know that during an exorcism, a demon can shout out unconfessed sin? This is why it's so important for those who are present for the exorcism to go to the sacrament of confession. Even Father Gabriel Amorth, the former chief exorcist in Rome, would always say that a good confession is better than an exorcism. Because when we confess our sins, we place them in the hands of God. And once we give something over to God, the devil cannot use that against us. So every confessed sin takes something away from the devil that he can use against us. You've probably heard this before about certain demons being attached in the family line. According to Father Lampert, it is possible for demons to get attached in the family line. Demons are very authoritative. If someone who has power and authority within a family gives power and the authority to demons, then they can have an attachment down through the generational lines. The good news is that that generational line can be broken. Just because the devil says you made a pact and it means it's forever isn't true. People can make a pact with the devil, but that pact can be broken if a person says they no longer want this attachment in their lives. I've shared an audio clip before of Father Chad Ripperger talking briefly about incubus, the sexual relation someone having with a demon. There's another exorcist, Father John Caro, speaking a little bit more in details about it. Father Caro shared that he had people who come and tell him that they really feel attacked when they are sleeping, they feel sexually attacked, and he even admitted that these attacks really do happen. There are indeed sexual demons, incubus and succubus, who attack people in their sleep. And I've prayed with people like that, I've blessed their room, and I said, okay, so somehow you've attracted to yourself a spirit, they're incubus spirits and succubus spirits. Once a female spirit, once a male spirit that attack people. And I've had people tell me that they felt violated. Okay. Mm -hmm. They've been involved in something of grave sin because mm -hmm. that invites the demon to attach himself. It's like pornography. A person views that, gets involved in that, then all of a sudden they can't quite turn it off. And then it's really fascinating. Then they go to confession, they find it much easier to say, it's not as compelling. I definitely believe with pornography, with some drugs, uh, with some music, that there are demons associated with that. When I went to the International Exorcist Conference in Rome one time, they had had a few cases of people who had been part of heavy metal, mm 
mm-hmm. and part of the drug cartel who admitted that they would bring in Satanists to curse their music and the drugs to make it more addictive. So not only is a person dealing with a chemical mm-hmm. dependency or music, but there's now actually a demon associated. Father Caro also talked a little bit about the demonic hour. There's a guy who's attending his church. He's attending mass regularly, and he's also coming to confession regularly as well. One day, the guy and Father Caro were talking, and he said, Father, I don't sleep real well these days. I have a lot of problems with my sleep. He told Father Caro that something wakes him up at three in the morning all the time. Because Jesus dies at three o'clock during the day, the demon has claimed an hour of its own. So he likes to do a lot of stuff at that time. Okay, and you've gone to confession lots of times to me and I go, but let's be honest. Is there anything you've never really confessed that's on your soul? Because that's where evil will get his claws into you. And he takes a deep breath. And he finally kind of admits to me, uh, yeah, well, he turns this, you know, I've tried to kill myself a couple of times. You can see that slash marks. Well, that's a serious sin. Mm-hmm. Try and, you know, kill God's creation. I go, and you've never confessed that all these years. He goes, yeah. So you're ready to ask forgiveness for that? Yeah. Okay. So I go through confession. Comes back a few days later, says, I sleep like a baby now. Hmm. Don't be keeping stuff buried in there. If we live a good moral life, it's very, very rare that those people I see knocking on my door saying, I think I got a serious spiritual problem. For the next clip is rather frightening, really, come to think of it. Father Caro shared his experience from an exorcism where the demon told him if people hate enough, it can become a curse. And the demons are going to be more than happy to help you facilitate that. Here, let me share the clip with you. I was praying over a person, and I had a chatty demon. Every once in a while, there are chatty demons. The church strongly forbids us from having a conversation with them. I'm allowed to ask certain questions, but in this praying, he said something that just stopped me. He goes, if people hate enough, it can become a curse. So the essence, from what I took that, the essence, the deep nut in a curse is tremendous hate. Well, how often do we, if we're not careful, let hate become too strong in us? Mm-hmm. That we wish upon someone else that something really bad would happen to them. Oh, demons are going to come running to help you facilitate that. Okay, now all you need is the internet. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, curse my landlord, curse my ex-boyfriend, curse, you know, my ex. Yeah, you could go online and find stuff that's, shall we say, legitimate. A lot of people are playing that stuff and they don't know what they're doing, but there's stuff on the internet that, oh yeah, these people know what they're doing and they know how to teach people how to do some wicked, wicked stuff. Mm-hmm. You've probably read about or watched the church or exorcist talking about Harry Potter before. One of them is Father Dan Rehill, who said that these books present magic as both good and evil, which is not true, but in fact a clever deception. The curses and spells used in the books are actual curses and spells, which when read by a human being risk conjuring evil spirits into the presence of the person reading the text. Curses and spells included in the best-selling books which were published between 1997 and 2007, include Avada Kedavra, The Killing Curse, Crucio, The Torture Curse, and Imperio, which allows the wizards to control others' actions. And in the next clip, Father Carell shares the same opinion as well. Let's hear what he said about the books. Now, I remember reading all Harry Potter's books, and I have seen all the, all the movies. I ask you this question. Where is God in all of that? He does not exist in Harry Potter. There are wizards and witches, and there are bad wizards and witches. And so you can pick up a wand that you can control spiritual power. I think that's really dangerous because then kids want mom and dad to buy them a wand. But here's the thing. The curses in Harry Potter are real curses. They're not made up. They're not made up curses. You know, the lady that wrote that admits that she 
Otto wrote that, that she was just inspired. She used to write in a coffee house because she was poor and she couldn't pay for the heat in London. And she said she just wrote it like it was automatic. A teacher, well, it's actually a principal of a school, told me, I don't understand why this is so popular because it's not that good literature, but it's just flying off the shelves. So I kind of wonder about what's behind that because there's no God in that. How the devil works is it's like progression. We get him to do something and we're going to be fascinated by what is done. Then the devil's going to want to raise the game in something else. He's going to want us to get interested in this whole spiritual thing that he's going to hand you something but you're also going to have to give him something. And down the rabbit hole we go. If by any chance any of you are thinking of starting a deliverance ministry, do you know what you have to do first and foremost? The most important thing that you have to do before you start a deliverance ministry is to have the support of the local bishop, your parish priest. Because if one is going to confront any type of demonic demons, demonic activity, it's important to know that you're operating with the church and the power and the authority that go with the church. Father Lampert was asked about this during a question and answer session, and he warned those present that if someone begins to attack the devil, guess what the devil will do to you? He will attack you as well, because the devil knows who's working to defeat him, and he will attack those involved in deliverance and even exorcism ministry itself. Sometimes people are well-intentioned. They believe that someone's afflicted by a demon, and they begin to pray over them. I had someone who came to see me and said, that they were, they were afflicted. A group of people began to pray over him. A demon manifested, and what did the people do? They were terrified, and they ran out the door. So the worst thing you can do is to actually cause a demon to manifest during a deliverance session and then run away in fear. So people involved in a deliverance ministry have the support of your bishop, your pastor, should be someone who's really connected with the sacramental life of the church, going to confession on a regular basis, people who have a spiritual director. So again, you have to make sure that you're truly taking care of yourself so that you can be on firm and solid ground. Because if someone begins to attack the devil, guess what the devil will do to you? He will attack you as well. Because the devil knows who's working to defeat him, and he will attack those involved in deliverance and even exorcism ministry itself. I really like what Father Lampert shared in the next clip. The notion of holiness and virtue really goes a long way, and that's really a key ingredient in anyone involved in combating demons. You cannot combat demons if you are in a state of sin. The devil cannot be divided. He cannot be cast out if someone is in a state of sin. That's why it's important for the exorcist to go to confession, especially before exorcisms. The Catholic Church says that sacraments are always efficacious, regardless of the charism of the priest. Maybe the priest is a bad guy, but if he does a wedding, they're still married. If he does a baptism, still baptized, celebrates mass, it's still the body and blood of Christ. But that's not true in an exorcism. If a priest is in a state of sin, the devil does not have to pay any attention. We had a priest come into the Archdiocese of Indianapolis to do an exorcism without the permission of the archbishop. He was doing the exorcism in southern Indiana. The demon manifested, and guess what the demon said to him? Who are you? Who are you? We recognize the authority of the local bishop, but who are you? You have no authority here. We don't have to pay any attention to what you say. He realized he had made an error. He stopped, sought permission of the archbishop, who said, well, you've been working with that person. You can continue, but then he told me to be involved as well. So again, demons are very authoritative, and they also don't have to respond if we are being disobedient or in a state of sin. Someone commented in one of the videos in this channel before, asking what happens to a person's soul if they die while possessed, and I replied I cannot give you an answer to a question I do not know. But I promised that person I'll search it for him, and I finally found it, and just so happens that Father Lampert is the one who has the answer. Well, the person's soul always remains free. And when someone dies, because the connection is physical, then that connection will come to an end. So something of the person always remains free. Sometimes people will say, if one is possessed, how could they ask for help? 
Well, again, the part that remains free can ask for the help of the church. And if somebody dies, then certainly the connection between that person and the demon will, will end as well. There was one interview where Father Lampert received a question from an atheist. Apparently, this atheist enjoyed listening to music with satanic themes. He said, I don't believe in demons or the devil, but if it was real, why haven't I been haunted or negatively affected? I would say that the demon has nothing to gain from that. If, if the person doesn't believe in the devil or evil spirits, then the devil would have them exactly where he wants them to be, in disbelief. So it would be the case, you know, is the devil going to attack somebody that's uh, really devout or unbelief? You could say that if the devil has already won somebody over, then there's really no reason to attack them. The devil is hmm. going to really go after those he still stands to gain something from. And I don't mean that to be negative or critical of somebody who's an atheist. That's just my perspective on that, that if the person really doesn't believe, then the devil has nothing to gain from that person. Because if the devil were to scare them, then that fear might lead them into a relationship with God, and certainly the devil wouldn't want that. So I would say the devil is happy with the person where they are. In another interview, Father Lampert recounted his experience during one exorcism in Rome where the demon was pretending to have left the possessed victim in the hope that the priests in the room would stop praying. It's great to know how powerful prayers really are, and I think sometimes we tend to overlook this aspect of our spiritual lives, how painful it is for demons to be around us when we lead the lives that God intend for us spiritually. But during the time I was there, I was on a sabbatical program, so that was the amount of time that I had to go and be with him two or three days a week. He literally would have 50 or 60 people at a time gathered in a courtyard outside of his office, some had appointments, some didn't. They were just hoping to get an opportunity to visit with him. But in one of those exorcisms, the demon stopped manifesting, and it gave the impression that the consciousness of the individual was now back. Was now back. And uh, Father Carmine, the priest who trained me, he was aware that he was trying to be duped because the person's voice was their own. It sounded like their voice and said, I'm OK now. Thank you for what you've done for me. The demon is now gone. There's no need for you to continue to pray. You can stop praying now. You can stop praying. I said you could stop praying. And then Father Carmine reached over and took some holy water and blessed the person again. And then the demon manifested and goes, I told you to stop praying. So he knew that the demon was trying to deceive him into believing that it had been cast out. And I think exorcist over time, the more you do the ministry, you gain more knowledge about whether or not true deliverance has taken place at a particular time or not. For the last two highlights in this video, I'll first share this about why the church do not want us to command demons except for these trained exorcists. So only the exorcist should be giving commands to demons. But again, the other part would be those supplicating prayers, prayers that address to God that anyone could do. And in the ritual itself, there are examples of these prayers that are directed to God. God, see how your servant is suffering. Come to their aid and deliver them from the evil that's afflicting them. Any of us can say that. But to say to the demon, I command you, I bind you, the church says we really need to be not doing that because uh, we could be getting ourselves into trouble. Even Cardinal Rotzinger, the future Benedict XVI, in the mid-1980s, cautioned against prayers to God, which anyone may say, and commands to demons, which are reserved to the bishop or the priest that he is authorized to give those commands. I would say that there are some people that would say that they have the right to give those commands by virtue of their baptism. But again, if you're trying to defeat evil by being, being disobedient to the local bishop, disobedience and fighting the devil don't go hand in hand, a recipe for disaster. And finally, about animal infestation by the demonic. We've seen it in the Bible with the swine. So it does happen, and it can happen. 
Animal possession would be infestation. So that would be under the category location, an object, or it would be even an animal. So an animal would be an infestation. Because obviously the animal isn't doing anything to invite the demon in. So it comes about because in the example of Jesus sending the demons into the swine, that's what God permitted. And it could happen because maybe somebody is using an animal in some type of satanic ritual or practice. Well, that is all for this video. As much as I love sharing what I found from listening to these hours and hours of lectures and interviews with all of you, I am learning about all these things while making this video too. So I really do hope you've learned a lot from this video. For those of you who'd like to make a donation towards what I do, especially helping to get better visual aids that are safe to use and not run the risk of copyright strikes or claims, I left the link to my PayPal donation in the description box down below. Any amount of contribution is much appreciated. Well, I guess that is all for this time. Don't forget that I'll have three books by Monsignor Rossetti to give away this month, and I'm still thinking of what books to give for July giveaway at the moment. If you have any suggestion, please let me know. Until then, thanks so much for watching and God bless you.